Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Kriba, for those kind words of introduction. Uh, thank you to the organizing committee of MAC 2021 for giving me this opportunity. It is my privilege to give this talk on the evolution and impact of poison control systems in India and share the experience from CMC Poison Center. Over the next 15 minutes, I would like to try and talk about the evolution and growth of Poison Center here at CMC Vellor. I would like to talk about the impact that we have created by sharing data on the course that we have received in the CMC Poison's Information Center. And I would like to address some unique challenges that we have encountered in CMC Poison Center. And uh, these challenges, I think, are applicable to the entire Indian setting. Now, we all know that poisoning and envenoming are major public health problems in India. Uh, we look at the statistics, we find that every five minutes, one Indian dies of snake bite, four Indians are disabled because of a snake bite, each day, two Indians are dying of pesticide self-poisoning, and each week it is estimated that two manual scavengers are dying of toxic gas inhalation. And we have to deal with uh, such a massive problem when we have a uh, doctor per population ratio, one among the lowest in the world. Now, if you look at the trends in Indian contribution to world suicide deaths and compare it with the world population, the green line here represents the Indian contribution to suicide deaths among women and the blue represents suicide deaths among men. The slope of these two curves are much more than the slope of the curve that represents uh, the growth in Indian population. So the contribution of India to suicide deaths has increased disproportionately compared to the increase in population. Despite this, in a country of more than 1.3 billion population, we only have less than 10 poison centers. If we compare the situation with the rest of the world, if you look at Europe, we see that the population of Europe is around 748 million and they have 70 poison centers, whereas India, which has 10 times the population, has only nine poison centers. Now in Valor, we also see a few unique challenges. Uh, in few areas in Vellore district, uh, we have reported suicide rates, which are the maximum reported suicide rates in the country. There are about 2,000 emergency department visits to Christian Medical College Vellore with uh, patients with deliberate self-harm. And the mortality rate due to poisoning in uh, Tamil Nadu is one among the highest that is reported in India. Now, when we try to do a root cause analysis uh, through a clinical audit on referral pathways for acute poisoning patients who come to CMC, we noted that 88% of these patients attended at least one regional hospital before they came to CMC. And all these patients were either discharged against medical advice or referred following clinical deterioration. Now, what were the causes for clinical deterioration? We identified three main causes. One was delayed access to appropriate antidotes. Second was incorrect antidote administration. And third was suboptimal clinical stabilization and resuscitation prior to transfer, causing a lot of intra-transfer mortality. Now, we also have this unique occupational hazard that we see in Vellore because 60% of Indian tanneries are uh, located in and around Vellore and their associated effluent treatment plants uh, causes exposure to their workers to toxic gases that can cause acute inhalational toxicity. And because of lack of adequate personal protection and late medical care, death due to these toxic gas inhalation is quite common. Chronic health issues due to exposure to chemicals like chromium is another issue that has been left unaddressed. So to summarize, there are high incidents of deliberate poisoning that we see, delayed access to appropriate antidotes, and even anti-snake venom is common. There is incorrect antidote administration at the primary contact center and inadequate stabilization before transfer. We also have unique occupational exposures, all of which together contributes to high poisoning related mortality and morbidity. Over years, we have been trying to address this problem and decades of uh, work have finally consolidated and culminated in the establishment of the CMC Poison Center in 2019. Now, CMC Poison Center as it stands today have four major components. The first component is the Poison's Information Center, which is a 24-7 service that is offered through the year. Uh, our uh, Poison Center is accessible to both general public as well as medical care providers through a toll-free number, email, as well as WhatsApp. Uh, we give information to the callers using primary information sources like the Talkspace and an in-house case and product data file. And it will be clear as I speak why an in-house uh, data file is very important. 
Now we are staffed by physicians as well as toxicology nurse educator. Uh, the on-call physician receives the calls. Uh, we collect relevant clinical data and provide information. We try to review the case after four to six hours if possible. And at the end of 48 hours, uh, the information is then entered into the database by the toxicology nurse educator. Now, the second component of the CMC Poison Center is the clinical toxicology unit, which is a unit that provides interdepartmental consultations in complicated cases of poisoning and envenoming and even adverse drug reactions. Uh, we do have a, a OPD running which, where we evaluate and manage uh, heavy metal poisonings. We also uh, manage alcohol, nicotine and substance use disorders and medical problems associated with these. <clears throat> Now, the third component that we have been able to offer off leach as a part of CMC Poison Center is basic analytical toxicology services. We offer immunoassay screens for psychotropics, CNS depressants, and drugs of abuse. We do diethionic tests for both detection as well as prognostication of paraquat and diquat poisoning. For advanced tests like heavy metal estimation uh, using ICPMS, uh, we rely on other uh, laboratories like the clinical biochemistry laboratories. Now, the fourth and one, perhaps one of the most important components of the Poison Center is toxicology education and awareness services. We have a toxicology nurse educator who gives education to both our inpatients as well as outpatients of our own as well as other departments on multiple aspects of poisoning and envenoming. We conduct education camps for adults and children regularly on various aspects of poisoning and envenoming prevention and first aid. Uh, the toxicology nurse educator also specializes in giving smoking and alcohol cessation education uh, to the patients who come to our OPD. Uh, we also conduct this unique snake bite survivors meet once every year, where we encourage the snake bite survivors in the community to become advocates of snake bite mitigation in their own community. Now, if you look at the impact that we have created, and I will try to explain this through the call data that we have received. Over the two years since establishment, we have received 3,639 calls. There is a steady increase in the number of calls in the second year as compared to the first year. We do get calls from all over the India, although majority of the calls are concentrated from Tamil Nadu and the rest of the Southern and Central Indian states. We have received calls from all states in India, except for the Union Territory of Ladakh and state of Sikkim. Now, most calls that we receive, over 90% of them are from healthcare providers. We get only 7% of calls from the general public. And this is something that we have been trying to improve. Uh, nearly equal number of calls we receive are regarding uh, events uh, related to uh, adults and children. In children, most calls are regarding accidental exposures, whereas in adults, most calls are regarding intentional exposures. We have been trying to follow up the outcomes of all these uh, patients who we are called regarding at the end of 48 hours. And in a small subset, we have found that most of these patients are uh, cured and discharged. Uh, some of them are still admitted when we uh, try to follow them up. Uh, few number are referred to other hospitals or discharged against medical advice. And very few numbers are actually uh, expired. Now let me try to address the challenges that we face and uh, uh, I will try to do so in making a few important observation and conclusions. The first observation is that there is uh, unavailability of the identity of the toxic products on container labels in India. Now, if you look at the number of calls that we receive regarding each exposure, we find that the maximum number of calls that we receive are because of agrochemical agent exposure, about 35% of the calls. And in these callers who have called us regarding agrochemical uh, compound exposure, about 48% of these compounds did not have adequate compositional information. So uh, it is very difficult to give information solely based on a database, because if you don't know the compound, we cannot search for that compound on the database and find information about the compound. A toxidrome based recognition of compounds is very vital in, in an Indian setting. And we do find uh, some toxidromes that are not classically described in textbooks. So this is just to show the five most common exposures of uh, uh, agents that we see in our calls. The most common, as I said, is agrochemicals, followed by industrial and household chemicals. Pharmaceuticals form only the third most common exposure category. We also do get a significant number of calls regarding bites and stings and plants and mushrooms, information regarding which again is difficult to find in a database. Now, among agrochemicals also, 
uh, we know that the number of calls that we receive regarding organophosphate exposure is very less. This is possibly because many people are aware about how to recognize and manage organophosphate uh, toxicity, but it could also mean that there are a large variety of agrochemic, um, agrochemical compounds that are now available and people are using these for uh, deliberate self-harm and accidental exposure to these chemicals have now become more common. So these are some photographs of containers that our callers have sent us. Uh, and as you can see, many of these compounds, uh, many of these labels do not have any compositional information. They have some vague uh, information like plant growth material or plant protector or organic compound. And many of them will just say what it is used for like louse killer and rat killer. So it is very important for us to know what is the local toxicoepidemiology. For example, we know that a purple colored avicide is usually carbofuran uh, in this part of Tamil Nadu. Uh, a lot of these compounds are also sold in plastic covers and newspapers and uh, other plastic containers. So it is very important for us to recognize the toxic drome and give information. Over the two years, we have been able to recognize a number of compounds based on the toxidrome. For example, we have recognized about 33% of 33 cases of methemoglobinemia, 54 of paraquat, 34 of 2,4-D, 194 of phosphorus containing rodenticides, 21 of formamidine compound exposure, and 129 cases with a cholinergy crisis because of an OP or carbamate compound, only on basis of the toxidrome and the local epidemiology. Now, the second observation that we make is that there is an oversimplification of clinical toxicology leading to delayed consultation. Uh, agrochemical poisonings were uh, initially assumed to be organophosphate in most cases, and unknown bites are usually assumed to be snake bites. 68% of calls that we receive are calls that we receive after there is a clinical worsening, either because of an uh, false recognition of the uh, toxidrome or assumption that a, a particular compound is OP or a particular bite is because of snake bite. This delays diagnosis to a significant uh, extent and they do not consult us until there is clinical worsening. Now the third observation which is in relation to the previous observation is that there is an inappropriate use of antidotes and antivenoms. For example, 87% of our medical callers had administered atropine to a patient with suspected pesticide poisoning, irrespective of the compound that has been consumed, irrespective of the clinical toxidrome and medical indication. Similarly, 92% of our medical callers had administered at least two vials of antivenom in patients presenting with an unknown bite or sting. Uh, and here, antivenom, I mean anti snake venom, uh, irrespective of the uh, uh, cause of the bite or sting and irrespective of presence of any entire global blood or neurotoxicity. Now, the fourth important observation that we make is that physicians can be an important team member in a poisons information center. And this is because we have noted that about 73.3% of the calls that we receive um, are because they are stuck with a clinical diagnosis or they are stuck with the next step in management. Only very seldom do we get calls regarding only poisons information. And uh, many of these calls that we receive regarding clinical diagnosis and next step in management are common cases that we ourselves have encountered in our clinical practice and uh, probably have looked up before. And we find it uh, uh, helpful to uh, give this information to our callers. And hence, physician can be an important part of poisons information uh, centers. Now, two themes that uh, uh, sort of emerges in all these observations, two urgent needs are that there is an urgent need to improve clinical knowledge and skills of primary and secondary care doctors treating poisonings and envenoming. And there's an urgent need to educate the masses regarding seeking medical help and appropriate medical care following an event of poisoning or envenoming. And I feel that uh, poison centers uh, in India can uh, contribute extensively in meeting these two unmet urgent needs. I will conclude my talk now. Uh, this is to just acknowledge uh, our team members uh, at Poison Center here at CMC Wellor who have uh, both contributed uh, to this presentation uh, as well as to acknowledge them for the work that we are doing. Uh, the other pictures are uh, from few education camps that we have conducted and our toxicology nurse educator who is giving information regarding safe storage of agrochemical compounds and uh, household products to parents who attend uh, pediatric OPD with their children. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you for your patient listening. I will be happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you.